This is Talking to America. I'm your host, Aaron Zellman. Our special guest today is David T. Hardy, attorney at law. David is the producer and director of a new documentary that will help all of us in helping others understand the true meaning of the Second Amendment. The name of the documentary is In Search of the Second Amendment. David, welcome to Talking to America. Yeah, thank you, Aaron. Glad to be here. Tell us a little bit about you and tell us where people can contact you to order the film. Well, I'm an attorney. I'm practicing for 30 years. I started writing on the Second Amendment. Actually, while I was still in law school, I published my first article back in 1974. I think it played a role in the revival of the Second Amendment in academic thought. It was probably the first what you would call modern uh, Second Amendment article. I've kept at it for 32 years since, uh, publishing and studying it as much as I could. The documentary, uh, if someone wants to order it, the best bet is the website, which is www.secondamendmentdocumentary.com, uh, Second Amendment all being spelled out rather than numerals, or you can just Google Second Amendment documentary and you'll come right to it either way. It's, as far as I can see, the first real documentary on the Second Amendment, the specific focus on the history of the American right to arms as opposed to, you know, the value of the right to arms and uh, similar concepts. Well, I know that after I watched, I was really uh, enthusiastic about it because, as I had mentioned to you, I think you've taken just hundreds of years of knowledge and you've condensed it into less than two hours. You've made it real easy for people to explain the history and the value and the necessity for an armed citizenry, which I think is what the Second Amendment is all about. Yep. I, I tried to cover every aspect of the amendment, uh, from the you know the political angle, uh, which... Uh, you know, the deterrence of tyranny, the prevention of genocide, which, of course, you and JPFO have explored more extensively, uh, and also the uh, concept that when the framers wrote of preventing oppression, they didn't just have public oppression in mind, governmental oppression, they also had in mind the concept of uh, private oppression by criminality and how important it is with self-defense, the 2.5 million self-defensive uses per year. Well, why don't we uh, break this discussion down into two main parts? Let's deal with things that people probably don't know, that they should know, that you tell them about, and then let's also deal with how people can use your film to help win the battle. What people don't know that they would learn from this film, uh, there are quite a few concepts, but I'd say one right off the top would be that the top constitutional law scholars in the United States maintain that there are two constitutional guarantees of the right to arms. Uh, obviously, we have the Second Amendment, but there's also the Fourteenth Amendment, which was uh, ratified after the Civil War, 1868, and had a clause in there forbidding states to abridge the privileges and immunities of U.S. citizenship. And if you go back into the congressional debates, they, the main reason for that clause, it keeps coming up, Time after time is in the states of the former Confederacy, uh, they were disarming uh, black Civil War veterans who got home with their muskets in order to render them vulnerable to Klan attack. And the governments were doing this. And I've got in there uh, quotations from the congressional record that are just beautiful, where one guy is saying that reads off one of the laws that made it illegal for black American stone arms. They, they actually had them and says that uh, last time I checked the Constitution, there was something in it called the Second Amendment, and until the state learns to respect the Bill of Rights and their local gun laws, I'm going to vote against its readmission to the Union. So there's quite stunning evidence that in 1868, the framers of the 14th Amendment also meant to protect the right to arms as they understood it at the time, and moreover that this was an intensely personal right uh, one of our law professors, one of the biggest names in the field of constitutional law, makes that point that when you talk about the second, you're talking about right to keep and bear arms, but it's in a political context. Uh, the militia will deter any federal tyranny. When you talk about the right to arms in 1868 under the 14th Amendment, it's very personal. It's not going to do, it's not you're going to deter political tyranny. It's you're going to fight off an invader at your front door and protect your house and your family. So to his mind, that makes it an even more personal uh, 
singular defensive uh, right than it was in the first place. I doubt there are probably but a couple of dozen people in the country who know that. And I've got, like I say, the biggest men in the American constitutional law explaining that that's the case. Well, now thousands and thousands of people will know it. Mm -hmm. Thanks to you. I'm hoping. And uh, as far as how you can use it, I, I designed this not to preach to the choir. Let's face it, we've got plenty of stuff out there which really just preaches the choir. If you already believe in your gun rights, this will make you believe even more in your gun rights. It'll tell you you're correct. I designed this to go beyond that. First, if you are a gun activist, you'll be well armed with intellectual information, the ammunition that you can use at the end of watching the movie. But also I intended to make it such that is, I could come as close as possible to guaranteeing making a convert out of anybody else you show it to. I mean, anyone who watches it will come away with the right to keep and bear arms is probably our most ancient right, dating back over a thousand years in English law. It was well recognized by the framers and intended to be a personal right. The National Guard has nothing to do with it. It's not even the militia. It wasn't legally intended to be the militia. Congress, when they set it up, designed it as a component of the Army. And finally, that the right to keep and bear arms is enormously important, both on a national basis and an international basis. And guns are used far more often to defend against criminals than used by criminals. So I intend to, and it will all be related with, here are the documents, while an expert explains them to you. These are not just talking heads. These are some of the top professors of constitutional law in the country. I want a viewer who is not you know, already a member of the Brady campaign. But someone who is in the middle, you know, knows about the right to keep and bear arms, but doesn't particularly care, to come away from this believing strongly in the right to arms and understanding why we activists view it as such an important thing. I, I wrote this to make converts. From what I saw of it, I think there's no doubt that you've made it easy for gun owners to go out and talk to other people and show the film and accomplish the goal that you're trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. I've got uh, segments in there. I mean, if you're talking about two portions of the population where we haven't made a great penetration, as it were, you would probably be talking about urban African Americans and women. And so I structured the entire 14th Amendment end to speak, and a uh, civil rights struggle. I have a couple of civil rights workers, and they would talk about how they owned guns and defended themselves against Klan attack with them, and how basically all civil rights workers or almost all were armed they ju it just never made the papers they weren't stupid they knew people were trying to kill them so I've got a, a drive in there that would appeal to black Americans the 14th Amendment is part of their history very much their particular contribution to the right to arms and the concept of American liberty and a pitch toward women because I have uh, women speakers, uh, Carol Bambury, uh, Sandy Froman, and some others, carrying much of the uh, self-defense end of the uh, film. What would you suggest that people in the African-American community do who believe, as we do, in the right to keep and bear arms, the right to defend one's life? What would you suggest they do to reach out to the Jesse Jackson crowd and the Al Sharpins and the NAACP who don't believe in gun ownership? 